At Staples Business Advantage, nothing can top the smarts and instincts of the thousands of experts on our team. While AI excels at processing data, automating tasks, and providing insights for better decision making. And when they're used together, they're they are far, far more, more powerful, powerful than, than either, either is, is alone. alone. Whoa. Whoa. I've never felt more alive. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make business easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. G'day, and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello with another view about investing in the world of COVID-19. We're recording early afternoon on Tuesday, March 31, and my guest is Julian McCormack, who's an investment specialist at Platinum Asset Management. G'day, Julian. G'day, Phil. How are you going? Oh, good, good. Well, the share market seems to be doing wonderful things at the moment. <laughs> Yesterday, we had the best day in 60 years on the ASX, a 7% rise, and today's gaining as well. But Platinum invests internationally. So these wild gyrations are reflected internationally as well, aren't they? They certainly are. So interestingly, China has been pretty resilient to all this. You know, They're back at where they were prior to this COVID issue. Europe has been sold off really heavily. So you know, it's bounced a little bit, but it's sort of down, call it 30%. And the US is down, you know, plenty still. So it's down just shy of 20% in local currency across, you know, NASDAQ, Dow, S&P and the Russell. But um, you're not the kind of investor that's uh, getting up every morning and just looking at um, what the market's doing right there minute by minute. It's a different kind of investing style that you're um, looking at, isn't it? <laughs> you, do, you do a bit of both at times like this, Phil. Um, <laughs> look, so we're, we're in an interesting position where, as you allude to, we're pretty long-term investors and we have you know, just this outstanding, from our perspective, you know, in our view, book of investments that many of which are as cheap as they've ever been and they tend to be a bit cyclical stuff like automakers uh, some shipping firms semiconductor you know memory chip makers that kind of thing and they've been sold off really heavily and they were very very cheap to start with so at times like this you actually have to protect the portfolio as much as you can and so we use we can hold a lot of cash and we can short you know indices or stocks or whatever and that that latter part of our activity actually does require a whole lot of really short-term focus because when so if, if you're short a stock you're basically long volatility so um with 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 shorting you're uh, you're looking at the um whatever you're investing in going down and making money yeah. for that going down That's and um vol exactly right. and there's a relationship with volatility at the moment as well what what is volatility just give us a quick explanation of volatility if you would so, so volatility is basically just share price movement and, and the funny thing about that is as markets go up and they trend, volatility falls. So, so, so the magnitude of movements of stocks each day goes down as stocks go up because we, we get into this pattern where we all get in agreement with each other. And so when we're all in, in agreement with each other that things are going up a lot and everything's rosy and the world's great, the magnitude of share price movement goes down. Now, in episodes where you know, we sell off heavily, like right now, the reverse happens. And so that, that's why you get these huge movements in markets because volatility is very high. And so, and it goes both ways. So all of the biggest up moves in markets are actually in bear markets. So all the biggest up days in markets, like yesterday's 7% move on the ASX that you referred to, that's occurring in the context of a bear market. And it's because volatility has gone up a lot. And that is reflective of uncertainty. And, and that's one of the terms that I've seen uh, being thrown around at the moment is the bear trap. Can you explain that and what that might be? Yeah, I think, I think what that's referring to is this phenomenon of very big up days in bear markets or weak markets or however you want to characterize that. And what tends to happen is you get this sort of few that was close type feeling Everything must be better now because of the magnitude of the up, up moves and it in, induces people to sort of change the way they feel. So it's, you know, just, just your, your listeners should, should note in themselves, after a big down day, you feel very differently to after a big up day. Oh, it's a terrible hay feel. After a big terrible up, hay feel. Right? It? Yeah, you just yeah, feel yeah. it. You can't, That's right. can't help yeah. it. Can't help it. And, and, and also, people shouldn't beat themselves up for that. Mm -hmm. That is wired in you. It's hardwired in you. you yep. There's nothing to be ashamed of. That's what makes you a human being. But 
that's lousy when it comes to investing because nothing will have changed in any great note between six or seven days ago when we were nearly 20% lower in markets globally and now. There's been a bit of stimulus that's been announced, but gosh, what, you couldn't tell that was coming a week ago? So why are markets doing that? A big part of the answer to why is just cause, right? So, so what I mean by that is if volatility is very high, there will be huge down days and huge up days, and it, it, it is just the state of the market. It's just where the market's at. And in a sense, those big up days are really bad signals because they mean that volatility remains very high. And you're likely, just as likely, to get a big down day as a big up day moving forward. What you actually want to see is real surrender and this real sense of, oh, nothing's ever going to go right again and it's all hopeless. And then what you actually see is volatility comes back out of markets, the amplitude of the movements flattens out and you get this sort of bottoming out of markets and you can build and go from there. It doesn't always work that way. You know, 87 didn't work that way, but but it usually does. You're well known as being a contrarian, a contrarian investor. And about a year ago, you were saying that the markets were in a bubble, that they were overvalued. A year ago, we were saying to anyone who'd listened, look, this is a really weird part of the cycle. We are very late in this cycle and things are pretty extended. Please, please have cash. And the answer was, oh my God, mate, you're telling me to hold cash. I earn zero on cash. Well, the answer to that is sometimes zero is a good outcome. You know, when markets are down 30%, zero is pretty good. And it's not just that. It's also that you get the opportunity to look at the market with fresh eyes when you've got a big chunk of your portfolio on the sideline in cash. Because now, you know, if you've been fully invested until now, and now all of a sudden you've marked down, you don't have firepower to go and do anything. You've got to sell a loser to buy a loser. That's the difference. And, and now we have to do the reverse. Now that it feels queasy to go and do it, you actually have to deploy the capital now. And, and, the, and the thing that you know, we, we, one must avoid doing is treating that as a, a guessing game about what the bottom is. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Markets are down a lot. You've just got to treat this as a process now. So whatever capital you've got around or whatever you can get into markets from now, if you can just save a little bit you know, per week, and put that into markets gradually over time into good stocks that you know or into good fund managers who you know or into just broad passive indices. I don't really care. Just do that and treat it as a process and try and get as much in now as you can over the next sort of two or three months. And over time, you'll be very happy you did. There's an aphorism that I heard over the last few days, and that's uh, the time to buy in these markets. The time to buy is when you feel physically sick yep. pressing the buy button. <laughs> yeah, it's entirely right. It's entirely right. And and you, the other thing too is you've got to get used to the fact that when you're buying amid very high volatility, you will look like an idiot at least half the time because what you think you're just going to get the bottom tick of everything you buy and it'll be great. No. So we're in a world now where equity volatility is sort of somewhere between 60 and 80. That means you're going to get movements of – to sort of five or six percent, and so within that, stocks will be doing some stocks will be doing much greater than that. So please don't feel silly if you go and buy something today and it goes down ten percent tomorrow. That reflects nothing. It reflects nothing. It just reflects high volatility, and you've just got to look through that. As long as you understand the business and know the balance sheet and know it's not going broke tomorrow, who cares? Don't sell it. Just suck it up and move on. Because if you're buying the right sort of thing. In five years' time, you'll just be happy and it won't matter that we're in this very high volatility period. So if I'm hearing you correctly, there's two aspects to this. It's um, looking beyond a, you know, next week or next month. We're looking at a longer time horizon of years, for example, and um, not to deploy all your capital at once. Are they the two messages you're trying to, to give? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, the latter is really important because we're in a very uncertain environment and you do want to – I mean, in general, you want to do this if you can. You want to – treat getting into and out of stocks as a process. And once you've made up your mind to do something, stick to it. As you know, you have to always re examine your first principles. But if you charge into something and you know you've got a hundred bucks to spend, you spend all hundred bucks all at once and it goes down ten percent tomorrow, everyone just needs to remember when volatility is like this, you will get movements that sort of make no sense. But they do make sense in the context of a market. The underlying thing is when people have to sell, they have to sell. 
they never have to buy. You've always got a choice about buying, but very frequently, lots of investors, if they're particularly if they're leveraged, if they've got debt, they have to sell and they have to sell fast. So that means you get this, you know, these huge whooshing movements out of markets as people have to rip money out of them, and then you know the money gets sucked back in very quickly too, because you know you've you sort of create these air pockets of of selling, and then they bounce back very quickly, and then they'll sell off again. So in that environment, just take your time, just ease money in, don't don't too charge into it. With Staples Business Advantage, you get the benefit of thousands of experts. Plus optimizations powered by the latest technological innovations. One plus one equals two. Three. Whatever. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. I think I heard you actually saying that you wouldn't know what the catalyst is, but there will be some sort of catalyst. Exactly. So, so yeah, thank you for saying that because let me correct my earlier point. We had no idea that COVID-19 was going to do this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and I didn't mean to give that impression. What we knew was if you are a long way into a, you know, it's either a business cycle or a market cycle or whatever you want to call it, we really must remember that this system that we operate in is characterized by big interruptions. You know, you call them crises or bear markets or whatever you want to call them. Uh, It doesn't matter. It, they happen, and they happen a lot, and they happen in the presence of a whole bunch of characteristics. And they are sort of as follows, high and rising asset prices, uh, strong confidence about the future, lots of use of debt, often very heavy investment using readily available capital for a future that doesn't arrive. Now, so the mining boom was a great example of that. You know, Let's all go out and build heaps of mines because the Chinese are going to grow forever and it doesn't come. So that, that thing is just inherent in the system, and, and it and it gives you these big interruptions or that it gives you the preconditions for the interruption. That's all you can observe because you don't know what the, you know, the catalyst is this sort of, you know, silly finance speak for it. You, you never know what the reason is, but you do know that a reason will arrive. And, and people need to have a good sense of the history of markets to, to, to just fully understand how regular and predictable that is. It always happens. I just want to say here, listeners, that the, it's interesting doing these um, recordings over Zoom. Julian's actually got, is it a man bun or a ponytail? What's the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, try to keep my unruly hair, unkempt hair out of my out of my eyes uh, and, and not being able to get to a barber as part of it. Yeah, definitely not getting looking like the big end of town at the moment, uh, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a listener question. I flagged this with you before. This is from uh, Stephen Mapp. Yep. He asks... Who will make it through and who won't? How does Platinum assess that in the current environment? What can investors do to identify who's healthy and cashed up and who won't go broke? It's a great question. Um, And then the nice thing about the question is we can all do the work. So any listeners can go and get the last, you know, annual quarterly or half annual, depending on the reporting frequency, and go and check the balance sheet. And if these guys have a lot of debt, and what do I mean by a lot of debt? Compare what they pay in interest to what they earn in income and look at the amount of debt they hold versus the income that they have or the equity in the in the business and people with a lot of debt are going to be in real trouble then we get to this question of politics and bailouts and that is very difficult to analyze so we've seen a whole bunch of mentions of bailouts for variously airlines uh, shale oil producers in the states uh, hotel businesses in a sense, we've got a, a sort of pseudo bailout of small businesses in this country with a whole bunch of measures. And that, that becomes a bit more difficult because, you know, I, I don't know which industries are going to be prioritized by those who seek to bail out. So that's a bit more difficult. But again, not, it's not impossible to analyze. You know, you can go and read, just, you know, you can Google search whether or not there's been discussions of bailouts for that industry or that company or whatever. But the main thing is, there's been a mania for using very low levels of interest and readily available capital to go and either buy stuff or buy back stock and negatively in that process rewarding yourself as a, as as management very richly and those kind of practices are getting punished in this environment because you, you actually just want cash on the balance sheet I just wanted to briefly also mention um, you've got um, a Dr. Bianca Ogden who um, runs the 
International Healthcare Fund. And um, yes. I'd, I'd, I would like to direct listeners to the Your Wealth podcast, which you both appeared on recently. Have a listen because it's a great summation, not only of the – she's a virologist as well. And it's a great summation of what's going on medically and why washing hands works, as, as, as well as some of the biotech and the healthcare funds and, and the innovations that are going on in, the, in, in this industry. Can you tell us – do you have a bit of knowledge about the, the healthcare fund you could share with us? Oh, enough to enough to pon- enough to pontificate, but not be useful. Um, look, a few things. I mean, the, the the simple start point is the technology around this stuff is changing so dramatically. The the, the outcomes of a kind of focused global effort to combat a disease like COVID nineteen, the, the outcomes are very hard to predict. You know, we could get remarkable outcomes. So, very fast in, in improved treatment regimes, um, very fast vaccine candidates, it would be the two principal goalposts. And, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff too. So all the, you know, so, so, so very rapid development of simplified uh, respirators and the rollout of those and, you know, all that kind of stuff. On the, on the technology side of things, we're pretty excited about what we see for the development of vaccines. And, you know, people need to remember how basic a vaccine is, you know, we're, where does the word vaccine come from? It comes from the Latin for cow, um, uh, uh, vaccus, because we derived, you know, early vaccines from, you know, sticking diseases into cows and getting out their antibodies, right? And that's basically what we do today. It's a slow process you need to either construct or, you know, vastly more commonly grow. Like it's sort of in the sense of like brewing beer. You know, you have to grow the antibodies that you want and stick them in to all, all parts of the pathogen that you want the body to identify and stick them into the host, and then that jogs the, the host's immune system. We're getting to the point now where we can snap off individual chemical compounds. So, so in particular, messenger RNA is the, is the chemical compound that activates the specific part of the cellular um, response that you want to activate. So you can you actually take off a tiny little bit of the tiny little pathogen, you know, the, the virus or bacteria that we're talking about in this case. It's... COVID-19, take off the bit that will alert the immune system to the presence or possible presence of that thing and get it to respond without the need to grow viruses in, in effect. So cheap, rapid to develop. Moderna, one of the businesses we own, developed a vaccine candidate in 42 days. That would have taken six to 12 months you know, on a normal timeline. You do still have to do the approvals and the testing and blah, 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 blah. So, so we're not out of the woods, but there is great potential for rapid deployment of solutions to this issue. And, and it's just a great example of how technology is changing in general in the, in the life sciences field. Yep. Now, I direct uh, listeners to have a look at that, um, that fund as well. It's a very interesting fund and the, the, the kind of uh, investments that are being made are very exciting. And um, I think Bianca made the point is that um, what this crisis is showing for us is that um, our own health has suddenly become much more important than we would have thought in the past. Exactly. Yeah. So, Julian, depression, recession or yeah. v, V-shaped recovery? Uh, not a V-shaped recovery. A lot of damage is going to be done to economies globally. And so what I mean by that, if, if people lose their job, it's, they have to go and find another one. If businesses have to close, there's a whole process around that, around bankruptcy and you know, reconstruction and all the rest of it. Maybe we can put enough government spending and central bank um, monetary easing into the economy to offset some of that, but I, I just don't think you can do it all. There's lots of channels down which the stimulus can't, can't flow. So quite a hard process to come back out of this event, I think, for very large swathes of the economy. And just think about, you know, your own personal preferences, right? Like, let's say there is a vaccine that's announced tomorrow and financial markets all respond to that and they, they all bounce. Are you going to rush out and ru- go to a cafe tomorrow? I, I, I'm not because your behavior is going to change. You're going to be slow to get going. You're going to be slow to travel, you know, until you actually know that you're not going to kill yourself or your, or your grandparents or parents by being irresponsible, your, your behavior is going to change and that's going to have a real lasting impact. That said, the amount of, you know, fiscal and monetary response is huge. And so it's not like the Great Depression. So, so, so hence, we're doing stuff that will have very rapid responses and we're doing it 
in unprecedented levels at the you know at the government spending level is what I mean. So so not a depression, but a difficult period for the real economy. And in terms of asset prices, I think we're going to change the makeup of the, the the regime we've just lived through, which has been pretty slack and low economic growth, but a fantastic period for financial assets because interest rates are very, very low and with very significant inequality. Well, coming back out of this, how can we say to people, oh, no, we can't afford a better healthcare, healthcare system, education system. We can't afford to pay you reasonable benefits. We've all just lived through a period of enormous accommodation, right? So, so probably higher inflation, probably higher, I would suggest higher social um, contestation around things. So strikes and sit downs and lockouts and whatever, because, you know, we're really stretching the boundaries of what we can convince people is, is feasible. So probably higher interest rates, probably higher rates of inflation, not, we're not going back to the seventies, but you know, just, just way higher than they are now. And probably quite a significant repricing of a whole bunch of, you know, in inverted commas, real assets, you know, uh, you know, sort of mining hard assets, copper and, you know, that kind of gear versus financial assets as well. And that's, and that's just a consequence of inflation. So a different world, a bit of a slow recovery from a pretty deep, deep recession, but not a depression. Well, I'm very disappointed that we're not going back to the 70s because I've been stockpiling flares at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, thank you very Sorry much for coming on. <laughs> it's been great chatting Thanks, with Phil. you. Great to talk to you. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. Thanks to Christopher Soulos for music production with that special greek alicious flavour. Remember, music always flows, even when the money won't. With Staples Business Advantage, you get the benefit of thousands of experts. Plus optimizations powered by the latest technological innovations. One plus one equals two. Three. Whatever. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.